Welcome to the DAU course, What is Machine Learning, or ML for short. We're glad you're here. During this journey, please connect with DAU if you have questions, feedback, or need help with an AI mission. Reach out to our software engineering team at agile at dau.edu, and we'll connect you to the right experts. Let's dive in. Our world is increasingly dynamic and technologically complex. Machine learning is revolutionizing the way the world interacts. It is lightning fast at analyzing very large volumes of data and extracting novel insights that we just do not see today. ML will power our decision makers, our digital defense, and it's crucial to enabling our modern adaptive warfighters. This business level introductory machine learning course is intended to help you manage or work on an AI acquisition program. Upon completion, you'll be able to define machine learning and distinguish between traditional and ML software algorithms. Identify use cases that may be appropriate for ML. Discuss how machine learning learns and define four types of learning algorithms. And recognize the machine learning operational process and discuss high level ML challenges. AI is a data heavy topic, so here's a course tip. To help with note taking, there is a course guidebook containing all important images from the video, and it's an AI resource to take back to your desk. To access the guidebook, stop the video and go back to the learning management system. Select the hamburger menu in the upper left-hand corner and click Resources. There may be some parts of this course where you wonder, why do I need to know this for acquisition? MIT professor Alexander Madri said it best. ML is changing every industry and leaders need to understand the basic principles, the potential and the limitations. You know, many are projecting that machine learning advances will be more impactful than the internet to both society and the workplace. Can you imagine not being internet savvy in this day and age? The professor says everyone should understand what the technology does and what it can and can't do. No one can afford not to be aware of what's happening with machine learning. And that's why we demystify how machine learning basics work in this course. Everybody in DOD needs to be on a level playing field and have the ability to plan for and adapt to emerging technology. The warfighter's counting on it. Part one covers definitions, learning, and algorithms. Meet Arthur Samuel, an American computing pioneer from the 1950s. In the early days of computer science, computer programs had limited application and computers themselves were scarce. So researchers had to look hard for reasons to write code and places to execute code. Arthur Samuel believed that programming games might be the valuable testing ground for this new technology. So he took a job with IBM to get access to computers and set out to program a computer to play checkers. Now at the time, no one was using computers yet to play games. And by 1955, Samuel had programmed the world's first stored program computer, the IBM 701, to play checkers and he named it the Samuel Checkers Playing Program. His accomplishment gained recognition when it was featured on TV in 1956, but Samuel wasn't satisfied because his program played checkers, but could not consistently win at checkers. It turns out there are 500 quintillion possible checkers moves. Not only did Samuel not know all those moves, he grew tired of trying to hand code the moves he did know, and he wondered if a computer could be taught to learn checkers from experience rather than from explicitly programming every single move. His goal then shifted from teaching a computer to play checkers to teaching it to learn how to play checkers. And by 1956, Samuel had access to newer, faster IBM 704s with slightly more memory. He provided examples to the computer, including contents of a book on checkers and all of the computer's past games. He programmed the computer to learn from the data and then improve its checkers decisions throughout a long trial and error process. Samuel documented this groundbreaking program in his 1959 paper titled, Some Studies in Machine Learning Using the Game of Checkers, and thus the birth of the term and the field of machine learning. Here is the definition of machine learning within the context of AI. Artificial intelligence is a broad field of computer science defined as the ability of machines to perform tasks that would normally require human intelligence. 
Machine learning is a subdomain of AI defined as computing techniques that identify patterns in large data sets, which then enables it to classify, predict, and improve over time when exposed to new data. In short, machine learning is a subset of AI that learns patterns from large data sets. The ultimate goal of ML is to team with humans to truly illuminate what we don't already know. So how might DOD use it? Consider ML for any situation where we need to go beyond what today's software can do. To analyze much more high value data in time to gain the vital edge, and or situations where we need insight beyond what is possibly known today in time to gain the vital edge. It's all about making sense of today's big data that is coming at us at an ever increasing pace in time to act and before the adversary does. Here's one fictional example. Suppose we need to classify DOD cyber attack threats in a new way. After all, we're DOD and our requirement is to spot threats before anybody else does. That means we probably can't rely solely on documented, hard-coded cyber attack pattern signatures like we have in the past. In this scenario, we would tell our ML system to analyze data from millions of historical cyber attacks and simultaneously, let's throw in some adjacent data as well. Let's say world event data corresponding to the attacks, see if ML can find anything. We'd ask ML to identify all threat patterns and predict common threat actors. And with that knowledge, ML could help DOD identify previous threats we never noticed, uncover emerging threats, and eventually predict future threats as well. ML has the capability to learn from multiple kinds of big data and become a great teammate for humans by consistently telling us what we don't already know. Imagine the potential value of that for DOD, but don't forget that our adversaries have access to machine learning as well. Three final points to help build understanding around ML's definition for acquisition, and then we'll move on. Number one, AI and ML are not the same thing. The terms are often used interchangeably though. It's not uncommon for a vendor to say, well, AI is really just machine learning. That's not true. And this ambiguity adds to AI confusion. An acquisition best practice is for you to keep AI terminology clear at all times in contracts with vendors and within your program. Machine learning is just one of many computing techniques that fall under the AI umbrella. So why the confusion? It's probably because ML is currently the most popular or prevalent form of AI. It's where a lot of the exciting advancements are happening. And many of the other AI domains like natural language processing, computer vision, and robotic software also rely on machine learning behind the scenes. Technically, they're hybrid AI systems that need ML to make sense of their big data on the back end. For more info on the other domains of AI, see the DAU course, What is AI? But for now, just know that ML is a subset of AI that learns patterns from large data sets. Number two, ML is a multifaceted problem solving approach. It's a potential solution to a requirement, but it's typically not the requirement itself. And despite how we use the term in sentences, including me, we might say the ML or the machine, ML is a how rather than a what. In acquisition terms, machine learning is a complex set of techniques that may be identified as a solution during the analysis of alternatives and prototyping stages. And number three, machine learning technique developers, those who invented it and those who work on it today, are inspired by cognitive science, by how humans work and learn. They attempt to approximate human-like learning and analysis capabilities. ML is considered to be a form of AI because it performs tasks that normally require human intelligence. But you need to know that no AI techniques, including ML, work exactly like humans do. The science isn't even close to that and may never get there. Machine learning techniques try to approximate the way humans learn and analyze, but at the end of the day, it is still just advanced software running on advanced hardware that outputs statistical models as digital ones and zeros. You may have figured out by now that machine learning is about learning, and we know how humans learn from data, but how do machines learn from data? ML tries to learn like we learn. Let's look at three high-level steps to human learning to better understand what ML is trying to do. Step one of human learning starts with input. Scholars and educators do significant upfront work to create a library of information or a library of knowledge along with learning materials in various formats. 
The more effort we spend at this stage to prepare information for students, the better their chance of successful learning. Step one is input to learning. Step two is the learning process, and that's how students extract meaning from the information or the knowledge in the library. Teachers use a variety of training methods to help students learn, and students are capable of learning in varied ways. Step two is the learning process. And step three is the learning outcome. When a student has acquired knowledge and gained proficiency, they're then able to draw conclusions and form mental models of what was learned. A simple example of a mental model is one we all have, how to use the retail checkout process. Once you've done it a few different ways, or for most of your life, you have a good mental model of the checkout process, and as a human, you're likely to figure it out anywhere. As it turns out, the human ability to create mental models and apply them to new topics are a big part of what makes us intelligent. Case in point, when the internet gave birth to virtual shopping back in the early 90s, consumers who were not computer savvy had trouble wrapping their heads around the online marketplace idea. To shorten the learning curve, developers capitalized on our existing mental model and designed the online shopping cart. Humans were able to easily apply an old model to a new paradigm. Keep that word model in mind. It's a common theme in machine learning, and it works pretty much like our mental models work, only it's a digital version of it. Next, we'll examine how machine learning tries to mimic the same three stages of learning. Step one, the input to ML is data. Data scientists select and prepare data they want ML to study. Typically, ML uses a lot of data, and usually there is significant upfront time spent prepping it, cleansing, formatting, labeling, and pretesting. The more effort we spend upfront to get the data right, usually the better ML's chance of learning. This is similar to our prep for human learning. Data that has been prepped for input to machine learning is called training data. Step two, the learning process. The learning process for ML is controlled by assigning it a learning technique. Some call this function types of machine learning. Similar to humans using varied techniques for teaching and learning, ML engineers select from a variety of learning algorithms that dictate how ML will learn. Step three, machine learning's learning outcome is a statistical model. The ML model has learned from the data and should be able to make classifications or predictions. Now all machine learning is software, so the output model takes the form of a digital algorithm as well, but it's not the same as a learning algorithm. Like human mental models, once tuned, the ML model can be reused against new data and in potentially new situations, which is how ML gets smarter over time. In its simplest form, the ML learning process is training data plus learning algorithms, resulting in a machine learning model. We covered ML definitions and learning. The last topic in this section is a term we hear often in machine learning, and you already have, algorithm, short name algo. A traditional software algorithm is a coded set of instructions that tells a machine exactly how to perform a task. In this scenario, humans write 100% of the instructions, and we know all possible answers in advance. Check it out. In this algo, if the end user enters three, we will sum all integers from one to three, one plus two plus three equals six, and so on. In traditional software, humans are able to pre-calculate all possible answers. Contrast that to a machine learning algorithm, where a coded set of instructions tells a machine not exactly what to do, but exactly how to learn from data. These two computing routines are vastly different. In the ML scenario, humans do not know all the answers in advance. Why not? Because there's so much big data in today's world, it isn't remotely possible for humans to process it, nor can traditional software effectively handle it. How could we possibly know all the answers, meaning all of the possible patterns, trends, and insights from the world's big data? We can't. So modern ML algorithms take a different approach. Traditional algorithms tell a machine exactly how to perform a task, and ML algorithms tell a machine exactly how to learn from the data. But after that, ML shows us answers 
we probably don't already have. Traditional is, tell us exactly what we already know, but do it faster. Machine learning is, tell us what you see that we do not. Think about this for a minute. Our community is in the information business. We need situational awareness and to make good decisions before the adversary does or before disaster strikes. When executed well, machine learning is a profound game changer for defense, intel, and the federal government. Now, I hope you've taken advantage of the course guidebook to help with notes. If not, please stop the video and go get it. We'll wait. Trust me when I tell you, it'll make your life easier. Let's finish up part one by recapping the side-by-side -side comparison between traditional forms of software and software that uses machine learning techniques. In traditional software, the algorithm dictates exactly how to perform every part of the task set. Nothing happens if it is encoded. In ML, the coded algorithm dictates only how to learn from the data and how to model the learning outcome. But we don't tell it exactly what to learn or what the answers are in all cases. Traditional software is 100% programmed usually by humans, but sometimes by other algorithms. It doesn't really matter. ML has little to no programming beyond just how to learn and how to model the learning outcomes so humans can understand them. Traditional software, developers can pre-calculate all possible answers up front. Now this doesn't mean they do it, but it's possible. For example, if our problem is needing to sum a million numbers, we can do it on paper. Not efficiently, but we can, we can calculate the answers if needed. We told the algorithm exactly how to do it in the first place so humans can get to the answers. In ML, we do not know all the answers, if any. We want machine learning to look at this vast amount of data and tell us what we do not already know or cannot see. By the way, a general best practice for any kind of AI is to ensure the problem you are trying to solve truly needs to be solved with AI. ML comes with overhead. It's not easy. And a primary cause of machine learning project failure is trying to use it where it isn't needed. So avoid using AI or ML if the goal can be accomplished efficiently with traditional software. Now back to the comparison. Data types and formats. Traditional software uses smaller targeted labeled data sets. You know, processing data is expensive in dollars and performance. In my 30 years of working in software engineering and software program management, we would never use extra or adjacent data that isn't exactly what's needed to support the algorithms. I never once said, yeah, I'd like to process some more data. It's hard. Machine learning uses large and varied data sets and labeled data is optional, but typically recommended if we can get it. How does it do it? We're using advanced computing techniques and advanced hardware. Hardware is a lot better than it used to be at processing big amounts of data. Machine learning techniques want to analyze large data, including extra or adjacent data, because looking beyond what we already analyze is the best way to uncover novel insight. Traditional is not able to learn and improve over time without recoding. And machine learning can improve with little or no intervention. Traditional software does not uncover novel clusters, classifications, or generally make predictions, whereas ML does. In fact, these two categories, learning and improving over time and making classifications and predictions, are the whole point of machine learning. And last, traditional software is only considered to be efficient, not intelligent, while machine learning is considered to be intelligent. And if we do it well, it's also efficient. Part two, machine learning use cases. ML is the most widely used form of AI. It's hard to find a modern software product that isn't somehow impacted by machine learning. Microsoft Teams, Microsoft 365, smartphone apps, your fitness watch, and Ancestry.com, just to name a few. Ever wondered how your home camera system can tell the difference between a dog, a human, a car, and a package delivery? ML is useful in situations where humans can't possibly analyze today's massive volumes of big data quickly, or at all, and then detect patterns and make predictions. To improve financial fraud detections, banks are using ML to analyze data to spot customer transactions and predict real-time and emergent threats much better than they ever did before. ML has driven remarkable improvement in earlier diagnostics for some cancers. 
by learning from millions of patient profiles and associated positive and negative scans and blood work and diagnostics, ML has predicted valid new early warning signs that doctors and researchers just can't see in the data. And ML is commonly used in conjunction with other types of artificial intelligence like image recognition to predict the identity of humans after learning from a cache of our personal and public images. In fact, I recently took an international flight and was surprised to find that the only boarding pass I needed at the gate was my face. I hope you're considering how DOD might use machine learning to solve significant challenges in your world. You know, we are consistently ranked as one of the top one or two largest organizations in the world. Not just the U.S., the world. And it's estimated DOD collects over 20 petabytes of data per day. What's a petabyte, you ask? It's equivalent to 1,000 terabytes, roughly 20 million tall filing cabinets, or roughly 500 billion pages of standard text. And that's one petabyte. It's imperative that we find responsible and safe ways to harvest our data more efficiently with machine learning. Here are just a few ML use case examples among the thousands in use within DOD and the federal government. Problem, how to decrease attrition. The Marine Corps has used machine learning to examine recruiting data to try and better predict key attributes of Marines who are more likely to stay in uniform. Problem, how to achieve cutting edge real-time situational awareness in an area of operation. ISR sensors create massive edge data that is impossible to effectively analyze real time. Edge data is data created on the aircraft or at the source of any computing machine in the field. The DOD CDAO and the Air Force are performing full spectrum developmental test of smart sensor capability on an MQ-9 using sensor-based machine learning. Sensor-based machine learning to intelligently process surveillance and other data at the edge on the aircraft. Problem, how to enable Mars Rover to process its own data at the edge and learn to make its own decisions about what to explore next. Here's another example of an edge data challenge where we have data intensive equipment in the field, in this case, really in the field on Mars, and no good way to get the data back to the humans at the central Earth location for efficient decision support. NASA engineers turn to a machine learning algorithm called Aegis that helps the rovers autonomously identify rock formations that need closer examination. Problem, Navy Enterprise Service Desk wants to consolidate 90 IT help desks into one and significantly improve IT support while they do it. And they're looking for AI to help. Navy has tested several types of AI, including ML algorithms and a machine learning pipeline to categorize and automatically route fleet support center requests. Navy recently executed a contract for a Navy version of Amelia, the conversational AI-based digital assistant who will troubleshoot and resolve the most commonly asked Navy IT support questions. Amelia is far beyond a chatbot. You may have met her elsewhere before, She's an example of a hybrid AI system that uses multiple types of AI, including machine learning. ML is being used now to learn from Navy's historical support ticket data, but Amelia has been at this a while and she's been around in production since 2014. Her company has been using machine learning for years to help her learn about things like human emotions. And she's supposed to be really good at sensing human frustration. So I'm looking forward to hearing from my Navy colleagues about how Amelia handles that and how it is to interact with her. To learn more or see Amelia in action, just search for Amelia.ai videos on YouTube. They're everywhere. And by the way, in this use case, AIML is not replacing humans, but instead is teaming with the humans to provide a higher value service product. And it makes the humans more available for higher order types of work. That's a DOD AI win-win. Good job, Navy. Yikes! Traffic. That's unexpected. Did your heart rate just go up? I know mine did. Okay, let's completely eliminate that thought and talk about how machine learning helps out. Most Americans use navigation apps like Google Maps or Waze for driving directions and timing, but they may not realize that machine learning plays a crucial role in getting billions of people from point A to point B. Here's how it works. 
Google's ML algorithms are constantly learning from data as much as 21 petabytes per day. Petabytes, roughly the size of the entire digitized Library of Congress per day. Think DOD's data is too big to wrangle? Google harnesses data on a scale that compares to DOD. So we know it's possible to do this and to do it well. Some of the data types Google analyzes with ML are authoritative government road data, highway networks, speed limits, intersections and traffic signals, historical traffic data and patterns, including typical congestion levels for rush hours and holidays, real-time traffic data from GPS devices, your mobile phones, connected vehicles, and massive imagery from traffic cams all over the world, in addition to 170 billion street view images, in case you need a photo of your destination, weather conditions, which can impact traffic flow and road safety, and information about local news and events. User feedback reports of accidents, police actions, road closures, and obstructions also play in. And I'm willing to bet they know something about how you drive and how I drive too. Google's ML system builds statistical models based on what was learned from this colossal mix of static and real-time data. And they use hundreds of models to analyze real-time traffic conditions, predict congestion that hasn't happened yet, estimate travel time for multiple routes, and update routes in real time as new events happen during your drive. Google has been using ML to process the world's data since 2005, and it has completely changed traffic and the way people move about the earth. To learn more about how Google uses AI ML and big data for navigation, search for these stories published by Google, a look back at 15 years of mapping the world or beyond the map. It's fascinating and it's also good to know that there's somebody who has to process data that's along the scale of what DOD has, and they're actually making it work. Part three is a deeper dive into machine learning algorithms, or as I like to think of it, how machine learning really learns. This is the high level machine learning process. First, we gather and prep training data that ML will study. Then we tell the machine how to learn by selecting an appropriate learning algorithm. After being trained by the data, ML creates a statistical representation of what it learned called a machine learning model. And from that activity, we train on new data to generate improved insight and decision support. Earlier, I told you that machine learning engineers select from a variety of learning algorithms that dictate how ML will learn from the training data. There are four major types of learning algorithms, also called, by the way, the four types of machine learning. But a quick note on data before we start. Training data comes in varied forms and conditions, and this is no different than in traditional software projects where the quality of data we receive may not be ideal. Whether or not data is labeled has much to do with which learning algorithm a machine learning engineer will select. Data labeling is a process of assigning tags or categories to each data point in a data set, and it's worth knowing up front that preparing data is often one of the longest parts of any machine learning project. Learning algo type number one is supervised learning. In this approach, the algorithm is provided with a complete set of labeled data, and that allows it to learn and make predictions based on the patterns it discovers within the labeled pairs. Supervised learning involves humans, where they act as guides or teachers by initially providing the data with the correct labels in the first place, and then by offering feedback during the modeling process. A potential DOD use case for supervised learning could be friend or foe detection from radar data. We may want to go back 20 or 30 years of radar data. We understand that data very well. We're DOD and it's labeled. But today we're looking at it to find something that can't be seen with the human eye or was not found in our past systems. That's a perfect application for supervised learning. Next, we have unsupervised learning. Unlike supervised, this method involves providing the algorithm with 100% unlabeled data, and it allows the machine learning model to independently explore the data, identifying hidden patterns and structures without any external guidance or correct labels. A DoD use case for unsupervised learning could be analyzing, let's say, satellite data. Perhaps we want to detect space junk. Given the vast amount of unclassified space debris, 
unsupervised learning can study unlabeled satellite images and perhaps sensor data to help us predict potential space junk. And then over time, help us group similar types together in support of disposal planning. The third type, semi-supervised learning, combines elements of both supervised and unsupervised. It leverages a small amount of labeled data and a larger amount of unlabeled data to improve learning accuracy and efficiency. It's quite beneficial when obtaining labeled data is too costly or time consuming. And it's also interesting for inferring valuable insights. A DOD use case for semi-supervised learning could be cyber threat analysis, where obtaining large volumes of labeled data on various attack patterns is challenging. We could leverage a semi-supervised learning algorithm to infer labels for previously unlabeled data by examining a small amount of labeled cyber attack data. The fourth and final type is reinforcement learning. This approach diverges from the previous three types as it focuses less on labeled data. In reinforcement learning, a machine is assigned a specific goal to accomplish and learns through a process of trial and error. Think robotics or gaming. It receives feedback in the form of rewards or penalties based on its actions and decisions. A practical DoD application of reinforcement learning is training autonomous drones, also known as agents, to navigate and interact with a real world environment. These are the four types of machine learning algorithms, also known as the four types of machine learning. Let's peel back the next layer. Underneath the four types of learning algorithms, there is a vast array of computational learning algorithm types available for ML engineers to choose from based on the specific requirement and desired output. There are well over a hundred types. This is a small sampling. And we won't delve into the details of each algorithm, but let's take a brief look under the hood just to showcase the diversity and complexity within the field. You don't need to memorize these samples. The first one is a linear regression algorithm, and that identifies the linear relationship between the data's input features and the target variables. Number two is a neural network learning algorithm, and they are powerful interconnected layers of small algorithmic nodes that enable learning of very intricate patterns within data. We most commonly use these with deep learning, which is a very complex subset of machine learning. The last example is k-means. This learning algo groups data into a variable number represented by k of distinct clusters where the goal is improving data organization and finding trends. These are just a few samples among the many available. And the key takeaway is that machine learning offers a vast range of tools and techniques to tackle diverse problems and extract valuable insights from data. It's not easy, but machine uh, learning engineers don't usually write these from scratch. They leverage pre-existing algos that come from machine learning libraries and frameworks such as TensorFlow, PyTorch, and Scikit-Learn. And with a very deep understanding of the underlying statistical principles, engineers can customize the algorithms to fit the project requirements. It comes with a lot of trial and error. We'll wrap this topic with a final view. This is a Microsoft machine learning algorithm cheat sheet. Just another sample to show you the breadth of possible algorithms. The key point to take away is that algorithm selection and testing is very complex beyond those four types of algorithms. So ensure your program has access to data scientists and machine learning engineers and testers who understand software algorithms and statistical modeling. Additionally, prepare for your teams to go through dozens to hundreds of iterations of the machine learning cycle in order to tune and validate this process. Part four looks at the machine learning operational process or MLOps for short. Machine learning operations or MLOps is the practice supporting development, deployment and management of ML models. It focuses on automating and monitoring the entire machine learning life cycle. Let's walk through it. Step one is to define the problem that requires a machine learning solution. Remember, don't use machine learning if traditional software will do the trick. Step two is to source, cleanse, and prep the training data. And again, this is often the longest and most important phase of a machine learning project. Step three is to select and run the appropriate learning algorithm that fits what we're trying to achieve. Step four is machine learning's output. What did it learn? It tells us in the form of a machine learning model, which takes the form of rules, data structures, and statistical analysis. 
Our goal for ML is insightful and trustworthy classifications, clusters, and or predictions. This is the step where we start asking, did we get that? Step five is testing. We constantly test during the ML process. Here we are validating the training data, the learning algorithm, and the ML model results, as well as cybersecurity. A key requirement in machine learning testing that's worth saying here is you always must test a working model against new data. We must validate the model works on data other than what it was trained on before we can go to production. Step six, based on what we found in earlier steps, we tune either the data and or the input parameters and or the model. This usually involves retraining as well. ML is an iterative process and we do this until we get it right. Step seven, we deploy the model to production. And step eight, we monitor and validate the operational ML model in production for any deviations from expected behavior known as model drift. Over time, the character of your data can change. So if you're running ML models in production and they're taking in new data on a regular basis, they must always be monitored for drift. ML has special cybersecurity monitoring needs as well on top of what we do for traditional software. A key vulnerability for ML is data injection. An adversary could inject malicious data into your data stream, which could instantly cause magnified bad decisions, potentially disastrous decisions. Adversaries are already good at this, so we need to securely encrypt all machine learning data in transit and at rest and monitor for any kind of malicious activity related to data. This ML trial and error cycle happens in dozens to hundreds of short iterations. To support the process, modern Agile and DevSecOps software practices must be in place and testers must be embedded with the team. DOD's disciplined ML ops can't exist in a vacuum though. To ensure a holistic and efficient approach to building and deploying machine learning models, ML ops needs to work closely with data ops and DevSecOps. Data Ops provides the foundation by ensuring the availability, quality, and reliability of the data used for training and evaluating models. Key practices in a good Data Ops organization are architecture, data discovery, ingestion, transformation, and provisioning, governance. They all help enable access to high quality data. Within DOD, you may integrate with multiple Data Ops organizations. Perhaps your product needs acquisition data that will come from CDAO via Advana. And you also need data from a service. This isn't uncommon, and DOD is now a data-first organization. So we're continually improving data interoperability. You're also likely to need data from outside sources as well. Check with your CIO and chief data officer to understand policies. The other key process, and really the process that underpins all of this, is DevSecOps. That's the software factory and the process we need for modern software. And it's what you need in place before you even put your ML ops in place. It complements ML ops by integrating security measures into the machine learning development process, such as secure coding, secure testing of model components and secure deployment of models. It also integrates automation. So more and more automated testing, automated building and packaging. Collaborating between MLOps, DataOps, and DevSecOps is crucial to establishing our efficient end-to-end -end workflows that our software and data systems need. Part five is ML challenges and risks that you'll need to explore further. I can't let you leave without at least a few warnings about machine learning. There are some things this intro ML course doesn't have time to cover, so if you don't come back to us, you'll need to explore these on your own. If you saw these giraffes today on your way home from work, what would you do? Of course, you would take a picture. And what do you see in these images? Humans would describe them as various kinds of outdoor scenes, but Microsoft's machine learning saw them as, can you guess? Giraffes. The machine learning and computer vision systems often mistakes things for giraffes because humans universally find giraffes quite interesting. Therefore, giraffes and many other anomalies are overrepresented in image data sets compared to the real world. 
This leads ML algorithms to come to the mathematically correct conclusion that giraffes are everywhere. And this is just one example of how AI can be biased by humans when they didn't intend for it to be. AI isn't as smart as we think. In fact, all software, all AI, and all machine learning are just digital mathematical representations of something. If training data fed to machine learning is biased with too many or too few examples, opinions, or errors, the output can go horribly wrong in an incredibly magnified way. Builders and buyers of AI must be accountable for the data used and any resulting bias. It's on each and every one of us. I can't stress enough how important it will be to do the hard work up front to cleanse and validate your data. I hope you leave here excited about the capabilities and potential of machine learning for the Department of Defense, but also please maintain a healthy skepticism. You know the old computer science saying, garbage in, garbage out, has never been more true and it's really on each and every one of us to make sure we get machine learning right. Wait, humans don't ordinarily give baseball bats to babies, do we? Apparently machine learning thinks we do. And about that, DARPA said, you know, these ML systems do tremendously well again and again and again. And then they have a bizarre example and you think, where did that come from? Well, there's a term for this now. Probably came out after DARPA put their video out. And many of us have experienced it with ChatGPT where you've successfully interacted with it for weeks and then all of a sudden it tells you something that's completely off the wall and you sort of wonder, wow, who's operating this thing behind the curtain today? This is called an AI hallucination or an artificial hallucination, also called confabulation or delusion. And this is a confident response by an AI system or a machine learning system that cannot be grounded in any of its training data, either because the data is insufficient, the data is biased, or it's too specialized. By the way, giraffing is becoming a term as well. Giraffing is the effect where machine learning tools are trained to identify overrepresented data. I will leave that with you to figure out within your programs that implement machine learning and certainly come back and see us if you want more education. Congratulations, you're at almost at the end of this video. Thank you for spending time with us on your AI education journey. Stay tuned for a quick recap of the nine key takeaways from the course. As usual, I will not read them to you, but there are four ways to capture. Number one, you can pause the video. There are four screens of them. The second way is to get it from the learning management system when you go back in there to take your test. Um, the third way is to grab them from the course guidebook. And the fourth way is to grab them from the transcript. Thank you.